Well, welcome everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, is it too loud? It seems like it's okay. All right. Uh, welcome to our sixth a uh, anniversary Halloween celebration. I'm really excited to have you here. So uh, thanks for coming. And for those who flew in, really grateful for you too. So, um, you're all family here. Uh, so we're excited to uh, share the what's been going on with medicinal mindfulness and those who are staying for the Conscious Cannabis Circle. We're really excited for that as well. And as I said, this is our sixth year doing this work and uh, at least I think five years in uh, over five years in this studio, and uh, when it was the third year, I was like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe we made it to three years, and now we're in this space too." Um, so a lot's uh, happened. Um, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge that uh, when we got started was right when cannabis became legal recreationally in Colorado. And we were one of two states. And Colorado happened to have some laws that allowed us to do this work here in this space. And it turns out we were uh, we uh, inadvertently landed in the only place in Boulder, which was the only place in Colorado, which was the only place in the United States, which was the only place in the world that we could have actually done this work in. Um, and I had no idea how special that was when we got started. It took me years to realize that. So, uh, so I'd like to just acknowledge Sadna here, uh, our ally and friend. Uh, <laughs> He's really the, one of the few reasons we were able to, you know, we were able to get started when we did and to continue and develop this whole program how we did. So, uh, so I just want you to know you're going to always be invited to everything on the house, my friend. So, so grateful. And um, we consider this studio our second home. Uh, it's our spiritual home. And uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, thousands of amazing experiences have moved through this room. Um, over the years. Um, you know, I, I think as we get started with uh, talking about what our program has been about, uh, and, and where we are in um, 2019 and where we're headed, uh, I just want to acknowledge that there's, a, uh, we're living through big times, you know, and um, uh, not only is our political landscape complex, to say the least at the moment, uh, but we're also experiencing significant climate change and, uh, and crises. Uh, you know, our, our brothers and sisters on the West Coast are experiencing fires right now. And, and you know, uh, just a few years ago, we had the huge flood. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we do this work, is not only are we healing ourselves and helping uh, transform ourselves and our families, but really uh, are transforming the world. And, uh, one of our primary goals is to be part of that psychedelic tradition that comes up with world transforming ideas, right? And we see this all the time in our in our personal life, and you know, with for me in my life, I've been truly inspired by uh, working with these medicines and working particularly with uh, cannabis as a psychedelic. Um, so I just wanted to name that piece, and I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I would suspect that we're going to be experiencing. Um, more crisis as we go, right? Like the, the, that we're going to be going through more turbulent times as we go. Um, you know, not to mention just the elections coming up, but uh, one of our colleagues and allies, uh, Travis is, uh, Cox, who's a Europa board member now, uh, says, you know, we have 12 years, you know, as climate change really starts to kick in, you know. So, uh, so in this period of crisis, though, what we're finding is that when we can stay regulated, stay present, engaged in our lives and our world, that we can actually thrive in these spaces. Uh, we can actually um, use these medicines to come up with solutions for ourselves, again, make our lives better, but also really help support the healing of the planet. And, you know, we did the DNTX project based on like coming up with an idea that hadn't happened yet. Um, but in working with the idea of DMTX, we realized that we can do this work with other tools. And not only other psychedelics that might be still uh, prohibited, but we can work with medicines that are legal now and do this work. And uh, cannabis specifically can help us, uh, we can work with it on an ongoing basis, right? Like regularly and it's safe, you know? And so. At this point, I think everything that I've been working on, I'm in this space so much with people as a psychedelic guide and facilitator and doing this work with the groups and stuff. I'm in this space quite a bit. And so 
I have a lot of time to sit and think about uh, uh, how to move the programs forward and how to move our lives forward and how to help, help people. Um, and so for me, it's been this um, fast track, you know, inner awareness and my own personal healing work. And, um, and it's been such a pleasure being able to share it with everyone, you know. I also want to acknowledge that we're live streaming on uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook right now. So thank you, Megan, for that. Um, you know, so we have friends all over the country who couldn't be here tonight. And, uh, and so we're just really trying to get the message out that, of what we're doing. Um, earlier, maybe just a couple of less, less than a couple of months ago, a friend of ours, Steve, help, is helping us with our um, business structure and like the overall uh, vision of how to make this happen in the world. And he helped us with a vision statement that I'd like to share with you. I added a few words, but this was mostly him. Our vision of medicinal mindfulness is to heal and transform humanity and our shared ecology through education, facilitation, and integration of safe, legal psychedelic practices. And uh, simple, direct, and really to the point of what we do. And, and for me, I like to talk about things. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, uh, <laughs> I, you know, other than keeping confidentiality in the sessions, you know, I really love to share what's going on with this work. You know, I want to be able to talk about it. And I had every intention uh, why I went to Naropa in the first place was I was going to be an underground guide. Uh, it was pretty obvious to me. And, uh, and something in my own process really pulled me out of that. And, uh, and one of the reasons why we work with psychedelic cannabis is so that we can share and talk and meet with the people that, that need our services. Um, so so the, the part for me with this statement is the legal part. There is just, this whole program started out as a, just a question. I was tired of, like, so I went to Naropa and we were always talking about uh, present centeredness, right? the present moment, the meditation and things. And a lot of the psychedelic community, it's all, it's all very future-oriented. And the statement is, when this becomes legal, we will be able to do this. And I started to realize I was getting really tired of that statement. I was tired of waiting, and I was also tired of like fighting and to push for the legalization. So I just started to really think about, well, what could we do legally right now You know, in Colorado? This was before even cannabis became legal. Um, and so I started teaching harm reduction classes, psychedelic harm reduction classes, and that turned into mindful journey work and mindful guide work classes. Um, and we started doing harm reduction programs at festivals, right? You know, we were looking for just ends. How do we do this work legally? Um, and we started to connect with uh, other indigenous uh, communities that were able to work legally, right? And introduce people to, to those practices. And then cannabis became legal and it flipped a switch. And the very first journey we did in here, um, uh, it was beautiful um, and very surprising how strong it was. And a friend of mine, I, I mentioned this, I've probably shared this story to a lot of you, but I mentioned this a lot. Um, a friend of mine said, you know, if I didn't trust you, Daniel, and I didn't really know you, I would swear you put DMT in that. And uh, that was, beyond surprising, first of all. I had had big experiences, but to hear it from other people, and then, and then over the years to hear it consistently from other people, uh, how profoundly healing and provocative and psychedelic this medicine was, that um, we realized we were, we were doing something very special. Um, uh, I also, you know, want to name and acknowledge that um, over 800,000 people last year went to jail for smoking pot. You know, and this number is, this is FBI statistics, and this number is increasing. This is increased in the, for the third year in a row. And, uh, and so in this weird climate, climate right, uh, of, of legalization and prohibition still, that there are areas in our, even our country still that are actually worse off, but haven't legalized yet. And, and, uh, and, and the, the, the uh, arrests in these places are increasing the overall totals in this country, you know? So we still have a long way to go. Um, and, and because of that, I always, I was, for a long time I've been an activist, and I, I decided that I was gonna put my activism and my healership together, and my healership was gonna be my activism. 
Um, I thought that was enough, you know, to hold this place of what was possible with this medicine. And now I don't think it's enough anymore, you know, especially given that there's some of these trends that are still occurring in our country, you know. Um, and so we're stepping into more work in the world in that way. And, and some of the, what I want to share with you is, is that activism, not just for social justice, but also um, climate you know, justice, right? Um, this is all our, it's the only planet we got, you know? And we have these tools now that can help us access these spaces to heal the planet, but they're not used in a large enough scale yet. And for me, that's what cannabis is all about. It's the medicine that's available now, and it can be used on a large scale. And so a lot of what we've been doing this year is implementing new programs and building the new programs so that we can really scale up. And I didn't realize uh, how much we'd done this year until we started writing the list of all the programs that, are, that we're already doing and coming online. And so I, I wanted to share some of what's, what we're up to uh, and how it all fits into one image. You know, um, so the last 2018, uh, by the end of 2018, I was pretty fried. You know, I was not only facilitating the work pretty regularly, but uh, also uh, managing the Sitter School, Psychedelic Sitter School program and recruiting and doing all of that. And I uh, uh, just want to name that Marshall and Megan showed up then at that time and like said, hey, do you need any help? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was just about to cancel the next sitter school because it was just, I couldn't do it anymore by myself. But I've been waiting and I've been calling that in of like the right support, you know. And, and so Marshall and Megan coming on, um, many of you know them through uh, the Psychedelic Sitter School program. Um, but we wouldn't be doing any of this without their support. Um, and I want to name that. And, that's, and then that snowballed into... Uh, bringing more members of our team on board. Um, Allison, my wife, and I have been uh, running the program for five years together. and uh, We had two babies during that time, and, um, and so there was just something about the magic um, that uh, we were creating um, that was able to draw the right people together. Um, and so, so from Marshall and Megan and Allison, we now have a whole clinical team. We're working with um, three medical doctors including our DMTX doctor. Uh, we have specialists in uh, assessment, um, addiction, and other fields that oh, we're working with now. Um, and we're bringing in this transpersonal perspective, perspective to um, this important work. And um, I want to just also acknowledge the, all our allies and sitters and guides who've gone through the program who've helped us manage this. There's so many people have, have shown up to keep the program afloat. Um, and, and I wish we could say, well, we're just going to do this one thing, you know, this, this thing and focus on, on uh, really making it happen. But from my perspective, it requires so many different paradigms of knowledge and so many different kinds of experience and expertise that we, it has to be complex in some way. And so how do we organize that? And, uh, and so I just want to share that, like the vision of medicinal mindfulness and the work of medicinal mindfulness is embedded in the um, structure of, um, of prayer um, and, and prayer uh, in relationship to the earth and, and naming that piece of the four cardinal directions and the symbolism of the four cardinal directions creates this solid structure that we're living in. So I just want to name that piece, all right? That, uh, so the West, which is behind me, is the clinical work we do, right? It's the healing work, it's the trauma resolution, it's the depth and the soul work. The East is also so important in the medicine community. That's um, spirituality, prayer, and community, right? And so for us, we can't, we can't pull out the spiritual from our practices. It, it wouldn't feel complete. But then we have these two other um, uh, directions as well. The North is associated with uh, uh, research and understanding and discernment and clarity, right? So we're bringing in research programs into our work and trying to base all of our, our programs on uh, research models that we know work, you know. Uh, and then the South, which is sometimes um, undervalued by calling it just recreational, but we can call that celebration and creativity, um, uh, play, 
uh, self-expression, right? And, and art, music, right, is so important in our community. And so the medicine space that we're creating tonight, the Conscious Canvas Circle, is a combination of these four cardinal directions. But it's also embedded in the whole structure of our program. Um, but that's just one axis, right? That would be called the horizontal. And then the, the vertical would be what we would call the transpersonal orientation. The above, the sky, the universe, the cosmos, inspiration, um, and also the earth. You know, honoring that we're all part of the earth, we come from the earth, and that um, for those of us who have family and wish to see generations and generations continue to thrive, you know, working in a way that's in alignment with the planet and community, is really important. And in the middle world, which we call the within, the reflection of all that is, um, it's also our society, our culture, Boulder, um, uh, Colorado, United States, and world. And, and so it's a big program, you know? And, and so this last year, I just wanna share some of what we've created and share a little bit about some of some of our programs that we've created within this structure and how, how they've grown. And so from going from Marshall with, um, with uh, Sitter School, Psychedelic Sitter School, for, for those of you who don't know, the Psychedelic Sitter School has a double meaning. And so many of them in our community and a lot of uh, traditions speak of sitting as actually imbibing the medicine. Are you gonna go sit tonight or, you know, in the ayahuasca or the peyote ceremony? Uh, it's actually, you're the one taking the medicine. And, and then the sitter, is also described as the one who's facilitating and holding space or ensuring that the person is safe. And so we teach both of those within, within this program. You have to know how to experience a journey effectively and skillfully, you know how to engage your own shadow, your own healing and such to be a good guide for others, you know, and, and then there's specific skill sets in guiding. And so uh, just this last year, we were finally able to find a retreat center, um, a really large retreat center that we're working out of now. And we, uh, we went from 12 to ish, uh, a, a cohort to 24, and then to 44 this last uh, time in September. Next year, we're aiming for 60, and we think we can fit maybe 72 people in the space. So, uh, and so for the edge, my edge is how big can we make this? How, you know, like how big of a circle can we create? And, you know, I, I even write about it in my book. Um, you know, like creating these hardships where a hundred people are coming together and, and that we can do this with, with psychedelic cannabis, you know. So we're growing into developing the skill sets of the capacity to hold space for this many people. And then we're also teaching people how to replicate this skill set so that they can do their own groups in other places, you know. Um, and so um, psychedelics guide training is the level two that uh, we've been facilitating and that's how to help somebody go deeper in the process. Uh, level three, which is uh, psychedelic therapy training, teaches um, our students how to uh, facilitate experiences for you know, significant clinical healing work. You know, so someone with severe PTSD or other really, um, really struggling, how to hold space for them. And then, and then most recently, we're bringing in um, a new program, which we're really excited to announce. We had the opportunity to uh, do our first inaugural uh, uh, class on this, but it's called Psychedelic First Aid, CPR training. So you're hanging out with your friends, and they hit their head on something, um, how to help them with that, how to handle a, a mental health crisis, how to handle uh, heart issues and things. You know, these are skill sets that people on the ground need to know. How to, how to handle, and if you're out in the woods, the, you know, uh, and there's not much support around you, what are you going to do? And I'll tell you, and I, the, one of the primary reasons I started this program um, with the uh, help of a lot of people uh, is because the only overdose I've ever seen was in the desert two hours away from anything, you know, and the person, the facilitator I was with, who I was learning from at the time, knew how to handle it. And I wouldn't have known how to do that at that time, you know, and so this, the needs are there. Um, so even when you're safe, even when you're contained, it's sometimes when you're a guide, when you do this work professionally, it's not if it's going to happen or crisis is going to happen. It's just what are you going to do when it does, you know, and that's the most important thing. So it's not, it doesn't mean you're doing something wrong if, if, a, if there's a crisis. It's just part of the nature, but are you skilled to handle it, you know? Uh, so we're really excited about that program and we recommend it for everybody. Uh, 
the, the, uh, the last piece that we're adding to Sitter School uh, is uh, something called, we're calling eco-psychedelics. So it's taking it out of the clinical and the healing, and also out of just specifically problem solving, but problem solving for ecological purposes, right? How to, how to use these skill sets so you can be resilient if an if a ecological crisis happens, um, like the flood we experienced or something. So you can stay present, not dissociate and handle it, but, but also come up with functions and skill sets to actually um, resolve crises before they begin, right? And so we're inviting activists and students and other, other leaders in the field to these programs to, um, to bring in this, in this new, new process. Um, so Psychedelic Sitter School is really an amazing experience and, and growing uh, profoundly. Um, probably within the next few years, we'll be working with med other medicines in other countries, including psilocybin, and, um, to name a few. You know, so we're developing relationships there. But I also want to give you all an update on the DMTX program as well. I know a lot of you all are interested in it. Um, I also want to name that um, Rosario and Carla here have been working on a DMT survey that's finally been finished and, uh, and they've gotten tons of responses for that. So we're learning more about DMT through the DMTX program already. Uh, but the big news is that we're going to Costa Rica next June, July. Um, for our first DMT retreat, uh, that'll be. Um, it will be working with um, local allies and facilitators of the medicine. We're bringing in a, a person who um, did a, created a DMT church in Brazil and other facilitators to help us with that experience. And this will be our first jaunt into the DMT realm with uh, the DMTX program. We have a wonderful retreat center that we're working with, uh, and. Um, and then that will be the stepping stone for 2021 where we'll be doing our first extended state DMT. Um, we've resolved all of the pieces, all of the technical pieces of from making the medicine, legal issues, uh, the type of medical um, support we need in the room, uh, how to work the machinery. We've, we've got the team that's doing it and uh, we're because uh, of just insurance things and other mundane things. It's being separated into its own program and, um, and we're looking for people to participate in that with us. Uh, probably by the first of the year, we'll be opening up to another cohort, um, a secondary uh, cohort. Um, the folks that we already have are getting more, you know, getting really good experience. So they're gonna be um, the uh, leaders of, of the facilitation of these, of these groups in the future. And we're just going to keep growing that program. Um, and I'm assuming most of us here know about what the Extended State DMT program is, but expect an update uh, by the end of the year on the website and also an invite to the retreat. And so we're opening up to our community and as well as potential uh, DMTX psychonaut recruits. So, um, so that's really exciting. You know, it's really hard to believe that we're actually doing this work, to be honest. You know, um, another thing that we've started, uh, we got some support from an ally uh, that we met at a psychedelic conference and uh, uh, our legal experts here helping us with this, but we're, we're starting a nonprofit. Um, it's in process. It's going to be called the Medicinal Mindfulness Center for Psychedelic Spirituality and Sustainability. And this will be a non-medicine nonprofit as an educational tool and ability to connect with other institutions and other allies. Uh, and one of the primary goals that I'm really interested in doing is, um, and it seems like we're going to be able to get the necessary support for that as well, but uh, build a, uh, get the DEA license to grow peyote legally so we can offer that medicine to those who need it uh, in the Native American church and, and to give back something um, uh, that has certainly I've been gifted with receiving, right? So I feel actually personally complete with that medicine at this time, but I'm ready to, you know, support that ecological and sustainability movement of, of particular plant medicines. Um, another thing we want to do with the nonprofit is to connect with uh, other, other activists and community members and connect with the decriminalized nature movement and the spore movement in, in Denver that decriminalized psilocybin mushroom, mushrooms and actually bring that movement to Boulder um, uh, or be a part of bringing that movement to Boulder. Um, 
there's some people already working on that now. And I don't think if like Chicago just decriminalized uh, nature, which is amazing to think about Oakland. And so what if it's on the local level, like the city by city level, you know, uh, county by county, and then, and then there'll be state initiatives coming up too. So within the next few years, you know, it's not unreasonable to consider that, like there will be mechanisms within our communities to provide, provide support for people who are going through profoundly life-changing psilocybin experiences and not have to worry so much about <coughs> um, prohibition. Right, and the fear that comes with doing our work in the world, you know. Um, uh, so that's really exciting, and and, I, and one of the reasons I'm sharing all of this with you all is that we would love as much support as we can get, you know. And, and looking for leaders, looking for people who are willing to take on pieces of this and support uh, this large vision, you know, and bringing it together. And what I found is that the psychedelic community were full of radical individuals. You know, but we're also really longing for community. So how do we hold that polarity uh, together to have enough freedom for us to do our own individual work in the world, but to build big ships uh, together so that, and man these big ships so that we can step into territory, a possibility that um, we couldn't otherwise if we did it on, you know, in small groups or isolated, um, which is what prohibition in the past is called, uh, has caused. Uh, you know, I like to think of like a um, alchemy metaphor. You know, they didn't have peer review in in the alchemical tradition. They kept their secrets. So if one alchemist discovered something, other alchemists didn't know about it. But if one alchemist accidentally got hurt from a, a technique that they were trying out, other people didn't know about that either and could repeat the harm that was uh, through exploration. And we want to change that. We want to shift that to openness and. Uh, communication and sharing so that we can all share, learn from, and, and grow. And, and this is what we're seeing uh, happening even with just the cannabis uh, practice, is that no one owns the cannabis spirit, right? No one owns a particular breathing technique. And, it's, and people are now bringing cannabis into their modalities of healing, inspired by our work on what we're doing. And, um, and, so, and so for me, that's been really important, is that we're, we've, we're no longer just exploring a terrain that's unknown. We're living and thriving in it, and we're bringing more people into this space and creating new territories of possibility, you know. Uh, and, and why we work with legal medicines is so that we can share and talk about it and inspire others to do the same, whatever that means for them, you know. Um, a lot of big things are happening. Also, we're creating, a, so many of you know that we use CBD as an antidote, you know, as a tool for uh, a safety tool with this medicine. So, with cannabis, and so allies of ours are creating uh, new CBD products that we'll be able to use in, in, in this work that's specifically designed for this work. And then we're also, with the support of friends and allies, uh, creating uh, uh, cannabis products that are non-smoked or vape that can uh, elicit these same experiences. They're gonna be longer than you know the smoke version or the vape version, uh, but I've, I've, from what I've experienced so far, it would be like the edible versions would be like ayahuasca, whereas the smoked and vape versions would be like the TNT. So it has a different feel to it, you know, a little slower, but still very deep. And so these are things that we're developing. And just because it, we're um, connecting with people that are inspired by our work, you know, who have particular skill sets, and, um, and we're inspired by their work. So a lot's happening. Um, our programming is growing. Uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Joe and Justin here, uh, who've been facilitating our music for us with community breathwork and um, talking to them. I'm inviting them to take over that program. I was gifting that program to them and us supporting them in that transition and, and growing, growing that in their own way. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then uh, Marshall and Megan are bringing on um, uh, ganja yoga and uh, and sound healing work, you know, and there's other people in our community bringing in authentic movement um, uh, and body work, other other tools and other um, psychological healing modalities that we haven't worked through yet. Um, and so that's been exciting to, to watch happen and see that grow. Um, <coughs> Another big piece of news that I'd love to share with you is with the help of Allison, who's been taking this project on for almost a, like nine months now, um, 
we're moving into a new clinic. Uh, we just signed a lease for a uh, six office clinic and we're bringing in uh, ketamine assisted psychotherapy with the help of some medical allies and friends. Um, and so if anybody's interested in, in working with us on professionally as, as uh, facilitators, we're, we're really stepping into that work now. Um, it's not, our, our office is not yet cannabis friendly, but we've uh, connected with several allies in this local community um, uh, who are getting um, approved or working in uh, homes uh, and retreat centers, but also getting retreat, uh, approved through social use so that we can offer, create a psychedelic uh, cannabis psychotherapy clinic. And so those are happening. So we went from having a, you know, a few private residences in this space to working now with a retreat center, a large camp, um, a clinic, and other multiple cannabis friendly spaces as well. So, so that's really exciting. Um, I think, <clears throat> let me just check my list here, make sure I've got everything. When we started this list, we're like, how are we doing all of this? Mm -hmm. um, I think last but not least, I just want to name that part of why we're celebrating is that uh, I wrote a book, uh, which is just surprising to me uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I joke that it, I wrote it in a week and a half um, with the help of uh, some cannabis allies. Uh, but it was, you know, literally five, six years in the making as we did it, but, uh, but I, I, uh, I'm really excited. I, I wanted to share how to do this work. Uh, so many people, I've been so inspired by doing my healing work with people one-on-one, -on -one, but so many people can't afford those services. Uh, so the book teaches uh, the theoretical framework for how cannabis is a psychedelic, how to actually make a psychedelic blend with cannabis, how to prepare for the experience, how to actually facilitate your own journey work experience safely, how to step into the work, and then the implications, you know, how to integrate, and how, to, you know, what are the societal implications of what we're doing here. And so uh, it's called Psychedelic Cannabis, Breaking the Gate. Um, one in an evocative title, and for me, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug, but it's to a gate, or it's to a path that is one of healing and transformation and inspiration, not to, harder drugs or checking out and things like that. And the primary difference is in use of is how, how we do it and what context. And so we teach that. And so for me, this gateway, it's a beautiful gateway, but it's locked. It has been for a long time. And, and, um, and so breaking the gate is how do we break that gate that stops us from stepping into our potential, you know, whatever that means for us. It's not just about cannabis, but what is that potential? I almost call it the path of gentle power, because that to me is what cannabis teaches as well. Um, that we can do this healing on our terms with agency, and that we can gently nudge up against the, break, uh, the gate. We can, we can find cracks and, uh, and, and break through it in gentle ways. It doesn't have to be um, life-threatening to heal, right? Um, so that's what we're going to do tonight, uh, is that we're going to bring these practices into one of its, I guess, highest forms at this point, and that's bringing breath work and cannabis together in a, uh, in a container that's safe uh, with music, um, and that we're going to work together to break through whatever it is that's limiting us and, uh, and step into what we're inspired by, uh, and that, that we can do that. It's obvious, right? And, we, and not only that, what we learned with cannabis and potential of humanity really is that we can do this over and over again. We can keep doing this work, you know, for healing and transformation, but not just ourselves, which is where it really all the work is in, right? But we can do work that can transform the world, you know? Uh, and so that might be what's happening in that there's a lot of people in the, in the country and in the world stepping into medicine work right now. Uh, to help transform the world and and our society for the better. So if you're at all inspired by any of these ideas or these projects that we're doing, we'd love to have you on board our ship and play with us. We call it an expedition for a reason. You know, and so 2019 is all been about building structure, creating a firm foundation so that we can really grow into the future. Um, and we're here tonight to hang out as a community, celebrate that piece, and to go into uh, 
what we would call sacred space together to, to share in that energy. Uh, so, so that's the invitation is to come join us in these uh, projects. And uh, again, can't thank the people enough that have really helped support this and keep showing up and, um, and look forward to whatever those next steps are going to be. So thank you for coming. I just wanted to give you all an update of what was up and, uh, and celebrate with you uh, uh, the, the turning of the season. So I'm very grateful. Anybody have any questions before we shift gears to the next stage of our evening tonight? Let me just, I don't know what time it is. What's the second book on? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Debbie, thank you so much. I forgot all about that part. See, I, so I have a bunch of scribbles here. So the second book that we're working on, Allison is actually taking the lead on. And, um, and so it's going to be a, a companion set with uh, Psychedelic Cannabis Breaking the Gate. And, so this is an invitation for all of us to share our stories. How did this work affect your life? Uh, where, you know, share your story of your life and, and how this work helps support a transformation, helps support a healing. Um, and you know, like I get to sit, I'm such in a privileged space of getting to see it over and over again, but not everybody gets to witness the amount of transformation and healing that takes place. So I'll be writing a chapter of how this work is, um, work me, you know, to say the least. Um, uh, but there's an open invitation to our community uh, of how did psychedelic cannabis um, support, support you in your path. And, and so Allison's taking the lead on that and uh, we're gonna invite other collaborators and other facilitators to write chapters. So if you have a story you wanna share, uh, we're going to uh, share that with the world, you know, because the first book, you know, again, I, there were certain things that I wish I could have added to it, and that was the stories. Um, and I, uh, because of the, the way it worked at that time, it wasn't it wasn't going to be part of that book. So, um, so we're creating a companion to it. So, so thank you so much for reminding me to say something about that. Yeah. Anybody else? Don't mind Megan, she's just doing the technical thing here. Are you going to look and see it? Anybody? Well, if there's any questions, no questions online. online. All right. All right. So okay, let's, let's hang out for a little bit longer. Uh, at some point, we will start to shift to the evening ceremony. And, uh, but please feel free to hang out and let's keep chatting. And, uh, and we'll just make an announcement when we're ready to shift. So, all right. Thank you so much again for coming. And, uh, We had 22 people 